All right, please stand your feet. We're in the book of James, chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 13 and go down to verse 18 today. We are in the New King James Version, and so let's read. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Let's pray over our meal. Father, we thank you for the word of God, that it is blessed and Lord, it is sanctified. And we're going to receive it today and receive that blessing in sanctification. Holy Spirit, we thank you. You are the spiritual teacher, the divine teacher. And you are anointing the eyes, ears, and heart of each person listening, opening them by the gift of your grace, causing them to see, hear, and understand what's being said. Father, I thank you for speaking to your children something out of this that they need. We thank you only you can do this. I believe it's happening right now in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Uh, high five someone on the way down. Praise the Lord. All right. So the book of James is a little bit different than most of the epistles or letters written to the church. Most letters written to the church, especially the Pauline epistles written by Paul, uh, the first half is going to be doctrinal, going to be, horizontal, be vertical, in him truths, positional truths because we're in him. And then the second half of the book is going to be more practical, horizontal. How does these truths work out in your marriage? How does it work out in the work environment, before the world, as a testimony to them? And so, but this book is completely horizontal. All five chapters are practical, speaking of the everyday life that we live. And so it's very important to understand that this is a practical book, a horizontal book, because there's some verses in this book that Many is misunderstood, and they try to make it vertical. And if you try to make it vertical, it's going to seem to be opposing some of Paul's teaching. There were some in the church leaders that would want to throw James out because they didn't understand this book. But you need to understand that's all going to be practical. And so today we're going to continue with our practical life. In verse 13, it says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. I love the Greek language. The Greek language says, stop saying this. Stop saying, I'm tempted by God. There's just a temptation within us that when we succumb to temptation, we get into sin, and we get into the consequences of our sin, we like to blame people. And so we play the blame game, but guess who's the first person that played the blame game with sin? Well, that was called Adam and Eve. And so what did Adam say? Well, it's the woman thou hast given me. If you hadn't given me that woman, I would not have gotten into this. And what did Eve say? He blamed, she blamed the snake. The snake was here. And so we, well, we tend to want to blame everybody. Tell someone, stop blaming. Take responsibility. That's part of maturity. Take responsibility for your actions. Stop blaming them on other people. Stop saying that God is tempting you. This is from the enemy. It's always from the enemy. Matter of fact, verses 2 through 12 speaks of trials, external trials. And these trials come from Satan to destroy us or to try to destroy us, but that doesn't gonna, it's never going to happen for a Christian. But he tries to break you, get you to sin, get you to fail, and get you disqualified or disqualify yourself and put yourself out of the race. And so that's verses 2 through 12. But he's going to speak about trials that are going to be on the inside of you. And so these are trials on the inside, and when inside trial comes, it's called temptation. And so if it's the same Greek word for trial on the outside and a temptation on the inside. It's the same Greek word, parazo. And so we looked at that the last couple times we're in here, that the devil always sends a test to break us. That's called parazo, P-E-I-R-A-Z-O, but God always turns it around. He turns it around and uses that test to approve us, to actually cause us to be promoted on the other side, use us in a greater way. And so when the devil starts messing, God starts. Yes. 
And so he does, God does a dokimazo. And that's the test of God where he approves you genuine and then approves you and promotes you on the other side. So the devil does a parazo. God turns around and does a dokimazo on the devil and promotes you. And so it says, when you're tempted, parazo. When you're tempted by the devil to get into sin, uh, it's going to come from the devil. And so let me tell you something. There's trials on the outside, but there's trials on the inside called temptation. Which is more frequent, the inside ones or the outside ones? The inside are much often because you may have a trial hit you every so once a week or every other week. We don't have them every day, praise the Lord, but you're going to have temptations every day. If you're following God, if you're not walking in the flesh but walking in the Spirit, you will have temptations every single day. This brings out the fact that if you're not tempted, you're walking with the devil. You're walking in the flesh if you're not being tempted. Someone said, I can resist anything except temptation. So if you're not being tempted, guys, you are living in the flesh. Wake up. It says, I, don't say I'm tempted by God, parazo. Some take this verse, though, that teaches God never tests anyone. No, God doesn't test anyone with evil, doesn't tempt them to evil. But God will bring you through a test to where you can get approved, you can get promoted on the other side. But it's always been started because the devil started the test. And God turns it around. Here's some verses. Well, Pastor, where in the Word of God it says God tests His people? Well, I'm glad you asked. If you're going to let the Bible stand in the way of what you believe, I'm going to give you nine verses that says God tests us. We'll test the people of God. So if you're writing, taking notes, look these up later. We have time to get to all of them. But Genesis 22, 1, it says God tested Abraham with Mount Moriah. Uh, Exodus 16, 4, God uh, tested Israel. Exodus 16, 4, Exodus 20, 20, Deuteronomy 8, 2, that's Genesis 21, 1, uh, 22, 1, Exodus 16, 4, Exodus 20, 20, Deuteronomy 8, 2, Psalm 7, 9, Psalms 11, 5, Proverbs 17, 3, Ecclesiastes 3.18. Well, that's all OT, Pastor. Well, how about the New Testament? 1 Thessalonians 2.4 says God tests and tries our hearts, speaking of Christians. And so, but it's always dokimazo, not parazo. He'll always bring you through that test the devil brings against you to promote you. Tell someone you're about to be promoted. <laughs> Amen. And he comes against you to stop you your assignment. Why do you have tests and trials in life? Well, religion says because God's trying to teach you in a big classroom of life, teach you lessons. <sniffs> the reason you have trials and tests in life is because you're on a battlefield. You've been left with the Great Commission, and so you're going into the devil's territory with the message, bringing out captives into the kingdom of God, and he will attack you. That's why you have tests and trials, but he's equipped you. He equipped you with his word, his promises, his sword, his full armor. With the spirit of God, the word of God, you are well equipped and able to overcome and come out and be promoted on the other side. It says, for God cannot be tempted by evil. Well, pastor, it says Jesus was tempted. Wasn't he God? Yes, he was God, but he was fully human. And so in his Godhead, he can't be tempted, but in his humanity, he was tempted. Hebrews chapter 4.15 says that Jesus was tempted in all points, yet without sin. And so we're going to find out that he was tempted, and so we are tempted, but he's able to help us. Tell someone you may need help. Tell someone else you really need help. Because we need help in temptation, and Jesus Christ is our help. He came through victorious, and he'll bring you through victoriously. It says, for God cannot be tempted by evil. And so all temptation, let me tell you what temptation's based in. It's based in lack or a sense of lack. All temptation at the sense is that you're lacking something that this is going to provide you. And so God, let me tell you, how can, why can God not be tempted? Because he has no lack. There's no need in God. You can't tempt God with something. Because he has, he has no need for anything. He has no lack. In, but, but guess what? Raise your hand if you're born again. I have a little bit of news for you. You have no lack in him. You're complete in him. 
You need a revelation of who you are, what you have, that you're complete as Jesus is. And you can come through not being tempted because you know the Father's love and what you have in Him. And so look in uh, Colossians 2, look at verse 10. This shows us that we are complete. It says, you are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. Now this is only for a Christian that's accepted Jesus. Raise your hand if you've accepted Jesus. This verse says you're complete. But most Christians don't understand they're complete. They see lack in their life, needs in their life, and the devil says, ah, here's a shortcut. Here's a way to meet that need, but it's an illegitimate need. It brings it out of bounds, and it's out of his timing. It's totally out of his will or out of his timing. And so there's times when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, and the devil says, you're hungry. There was a legitimate need to eat, but it wasn't time to eat yet. And so he says, well, why don't you, you're God, you, you, can, you can create... Turn that stone into garlic bread with butter running right down the middle of it. He could have done it because he laid aside his divine product. He could have picked it up at any time, but he says, no, man shall live by bread alone. But man shall not be lived by bread alone, but by every word. that you, you need a word from God. Word from God. And so the temptation is to get your legitimate need met outside the will of God or out of the timing of God. And so, and, and so all temptation is based on a sense of lack. How did he get Eve into sin? He, he created a sense of lack in her. And so in Genesis 3.1, he came to the woman and said, Has God not said that you can't eat of every tree in the garden? Really? God says you can't eat of any of the trees? She goes, no, 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 I can eat any of the trees, except for I can't have that one. <gasps> oh, he wanted to point out what she couldn't have. And then almost says, oh, boy, that really looks attractive. And so you're attracted to something you can't have, and so feel like you need it. And then, she said, then the devil said to her that God's holding out on you because the day you eat, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. But they were already like God created in his image, but deceived her into thinking she didn't have and God was holding out on her and then she was ripe for temptation. So temptation is based upon a legitimate need that's taken out of bounds or the will of God. And so the more you understand and believe you're complete in Christ, the less temptations, the less temptable you become. And so here it says God does not tempt uh, anyone. So God doesn't test people with evil. And so he's not going to tempt you into evil. Look at verse 14. But each one, say each one. Each one. Tell someone you're an each one. This is your verse. It's for you. But each one is tempted when other people cause you to sin. I'm sorry, clueless translation. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Everyone's tempted. Look at the word tempted, parazo. That's from the devil. Temptation is to find our needs met outside the plan of God, his purposes and provision. Drawn away. Say drawn away. I love the Greek word. The Greek word literally means to be lured. Lured by bait. This is a fishing term in the Greek. To be lured. Raise your hand up. Is anybody fish, is a fisher man or fisher woman? I feed fish. <laughs> I put the bait out. I reel it in and there's nothing but a hook. So I feed fish. The enemy knows our weaknesses. The book of Hebrews says, lay aside the sin. Say the sin. That easily ensnares us. Because each one of us have a weakness. We have a the sin that without the power of God we'll give into. And your the sin is different than the person next to you. There's the sin. And so we judge other people for their the sin when we don't have the sin they have. And it says, uh, but we're drawn away. We're lured. As an expert fisherman like myself, you have a lure for every kind of fish that's desirable to them because not all fish are the same. Not all desire the same thing. You need to know what's desirable for the fish that you're trying to catch. 
So the enemy knows our weak spot and what is attractive to us uniquely. The enemy is an expert at luring and baiting people. He knows just the lure that is the most attractive to you. What you're lured, lured by the most is what you're hungriest for. Let me say it over here. What you're lured by the most is what you're the hungriest for. Ask someone, what are you hungry for? Mexican. I'm honest with you. No, what's your heart hungry for? Because the devil knows what your heart is hungry for. And all of us at some level are hungry for the love of God. Hungry for the life of God. And so a heart that is not filled with the love of God is temptable. But let me tell you something. If your heart is filled with the love of God, you can't tempt a heart filled with the love of God. It says that you're drawn away of your own desires. Well, pastor, I thought this was a test from the devil. Yes, it starts out that way. But how does he test us? How does it come? Okay, human beings, you've been around for a while. You've been tempted. Where does the tempting, where, how does he tempt you? Where does it start with? Okay, a thought. A thought comes in. He tempts you with a thought. But then what do you do with the thought is so important. Do you have a bouncer at the door of club mind? Or is that just any entrance? Come on in. No, you need to have a bouncer called the Word of God at the door, and you're going to kick it out and bring it to the obedience of the finished work of Jesus. Or if you entertain those thoughts, that's when your own emotions and your own desires start kicking in and becomes yours. You own it at that point. And so when we yield to those thoughts and meditate on them, they become our desires. Emotions and desires are connected to our thought life, guys. Emotions are like attachments to email. You love email, right? Don't you love, atta- don't you love when you send an email and forget the attachment? And then you get everybody emailing you back, you forgot the attachment. Oh, I forgot the attachment. Well, what's the attachment? The email is the thought, but if you read the email and dwell on the email, There's an attachment and an emotion and a desire that goes with it, and then you own it when you open the attachment. Tell someone, don't open the attachment. (laughs) Well, how do I do that? Don't read the email. Don't reread and reread and reread and reread and reread the email. The fact is you cannot go somewhere in the natural. You have not gone first in your mind. You find yourself at the refrigerator. You went there in your mind. You were there in your mind. You can't show up at Amy's Donuts when your mind hadn't been at Amy's Donuts. That Amy, it's her fault. She wasn't so good at making donuts. A father ordered his son, don't swim again in the canal. Okay, dad. He answered, but he came home carrying a wet bathing suit that evening. Where have you been? Demanded the father. Swimming in the canal, answered the boy. Didn't I tell you not to swim there? Asked the father. Well, yes, sir. Well, why did you? Well, dad, he explained, I had my bathing suit with me and I couldn't resist the temptation. So, well, why did you take your bathing suit with you? Well, the son said, so I'd be prepared to swim in case I was tempted. (laughs) We are often our own worst enemy. Someone said, we have met the enemy and he is us. Tell someone you're your own worst enemy. So it says... That each one is tempted when they're drawn away or lured and enticed. Look at the word enticed. It means to hook. To hook. No longer are you being lured towards it, but you bite on it. And there's a hook in it. And you're hooked. Well, when are you hooked? If you continue to look at the object of desire, even as it's in your mind, you'll get hooked. Um, Genesis 3, we looked at that. 
It said, Eve, the woman saw, say saw, the fruit of the tree and she took it. Hook. In Joshua 7, they were ticking Jericho and God told Joshua, don't take any of the plunder of Jericho. It's the first fruits. It's the tithe of all the nations, the, the tithe of all the cities. You're not to take any of it, but Achan saw the gold and the silver and the vestments. Achan saw the plunder and took them. Hook. David, when kings went forth to battle, David stayed at home. And it says, David arose from his bed in the evening. I don't know about you, but I'm a night sleeper. <laughs> David's taking time off. I don't need, well, we have such a powerful army, I don't even need to go anymore. We're all that, and we, we don't really need God even. And so I'm going to stay home and lay around and sleep late and watch ESPN have some Cheetos and take some naps. And he woke up in the middle of the, right in the evening time and was bored. Went around and it says in 2 Samuel eleven two, David saw a woman and took her. Say hook. It's important where you look. Especially when you're tempted. You need to look at Jesus when you're tempted. Tell someone you need to look at Jesus. You need to keep looking at Jesus. You need to keep on looking at Jesus. But guess what? When you look at Jesus, you have victory over temptation every single time. It's hard to fight temptation by looking at the temptation. In speaking of David, temptation rarely comes during working hours. It's in your leisure time that men and women are made or marred. Your leisure time. Look at verse 15. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown brings forth death. Then. Say then. Yes. Then when? when? When you've been lured and you've been hooked. This verse speaks of the life cycle of sin. When desire is conceived, well, what's conception? Well, lust is conceived when an evil thought or suggestion has been courted in your mind and heart. Raise your hand if you're married. You know what courtship is. courtship some people are courting with that thought and suggestion in their mind conception out of the will of God a man was on a diet and struggling he had to go downtown as he started out he remembered that his route took him by the donut shop as he got closer he thought well a cup of coffee and a donut would hit the spot then he remembered his diet. Hmm. That's when he prayed, Lord, if you want me to stop for a donut and coffee, let there be a parking place right in front of the shop. <laughs> and sure enough, he found the parking place right in front on his seventh time around the block. Emotions and desires are connected to thoughts, and it's very difficult to stop sinning once lust and desire has been conceived in the heart. How do you know it's been conceived? You start making plans to fulfill it. Plans in fulfilling it. A little boy's mother had just baked a fresh batch of cookies, and the smell was going through the house, and she placed them in the cookie jar and giving instructions that no one was to touch them until dinner, after dinner. But it was not long until she heard the lid of the jar move. She called out, son, what are you doing? To which a meek, quiet voice called back, my hand is in the cookie jar resisting temptation. 
The fact is, no one can resist temptation with his or her hand in the cookie jar. It's difficult not to sin when desire has been conceived. So what do you do with temptation? Hang around? Look at 2 Timothy 2, look at verse 22. 2 Timothy 2, look at verse 22. He told Timothy, a young man, he said, stick around because you're stronger than youthful lusts. What did he say? Run! Run, run. Flee is Old Testament. Old King James for run. Run. But where do you run to? You run somewhere. Do you run towards righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord with a pure heart? What did Joseph in the Old Testament do when he's being tempted by Potiphar's wife? Did he like hang around and make excuses to be in the house? Think, I know I can handle this, but I want a little view. He didn't want to be in the house. Didn't even when he was in the house, didn't know she was there. And what happened when she grabbed him? He ran. Because if you don't, it gives birth to sin. Now, guys, temptation is not a sin. And the devil's a dirty devil. He will tempt you, and then he'll say, oh, you dirty thing. How could you be tempted? Temptation is not a sin. Say, temptation is not a sin. If temptation was a sin, Jesus sinned. Says he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Guys, temptation is not sin. It's what do you do with the temptation? Where does your mind fix itself? On Jesus or on the natural? And sin, when it's full grown, say full grown, when it grows up and leaves the house, it has a child itself, and this child is death. Sin, when it's grown up, it brings forth death. Death means a separation. That means a, that could be a, depra- a separation of relationships. It can be a, a separation from financial prosperity. It can be a separation from health. It can be a separation from the, from the, uh, the, the power of God. But it brings forth a separation or death. Let me say this. Death is the child of sin and the great grandchild of lust. Let me say it again. Death is the child of sin And the great-grandchild of lust. Well, last time I checked, you can't have a great-grandchild without a child. Amen. You say, well, I love grandchildren. Well, well, that's good. The right ones, those are good. You know, the the blessing of having grandchildren is the reward for not killing your kids. (laughs) You're struggling with your kids right now. Come on, patience. Grandchildren are coming. (laughs) Just joking. Verse 16. Do not be deceived. The Greek says stop being deceived. Stop being deceived, my beloved brethren. The problem with being deceived is what? You don't know you're deceived. Unless you have the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and a spouse. They will help you not be deceived. Sorry. I'm, I'm being tempted. And I'm being hooked. So I better not. Don't be deceived. My beloved brethren. Right here is a major key. Say major key. Major. To overcoming sin and temptation. Know that you're loved. You are the beloved of God. Say, I'm beloved, I'm beloved. Of, God. of God. Eternally. And infinitely loved by God. See, a heart that's filled with the love of God has no room for anything else. God is love. And when the love of God fills your heart, you're filled with God. And God cannot be tempted because there's no lack. So the best thing you can do as a Christian is daily meditate on the love of God for you. The more you do that, the less temptable you become. You become inoculated against temptation. And it says, next of all, my beloved brethren. Say brethren. 
Here's another key to not sinning is understanding and receiving that the fact that you are a child of God and has his nature. He's not temptable. In your nature, in your spirit, neither are you. It's your soul you're tempted, in your flesh you're tempted. Your spirit cannot be tempted. Your spirit cannot sin. It's, it's vacuum-packed by the Holy Spirit. You're perfected in your spirit, and you, and you are one with the Lord. And so there's no temptation that takes place in your born-again spirit. If you'll live from your born-again spirit, you overcome by the power of God. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from where? Above. Above. It comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Say good gifts, gifts. perfect gifts. gifts. God has good gifts and he has perfect gifts. What's the difference between a good gift from God and a Perfect gift from God. I'm glad you asked. Good gifts are the natural gifts he gives us. Those are the earthly blessings that we have. They're good gifts. But let me tell you something. With everything in the natural that could be good, there's always some negative that goes with it. It's called the curse that's in the earth. There's thorns and there's there's weeds and everything. With every blessing in the natural, there's some negatives that go along with it that you have to deal with. Well, pastor, prove it. Well, raise your hand if you'd like a brand new car. A brand new car! Yeah, but guess what comes with the brand new car? Gas? You have to go buy the gas. Insurance. It breaks down. You have to go to the mechanic. It has has oil. It needs stuff. Guess what? Everything in the natural has some negatives to it. But what are the perfect gifts from God? Those are the spiritual blessings in Christ. Like righteousness and peace. Those have no negatives to it. But in the natural, in this earth, every rose has a... Oh, there's temptation. Guns and roses. No, I will not sing it. It isn't my key, though. No, okay. God can bless you with a good car, but you got to put gas in it. All right, so there's perfect gifts... And they co- it comes down. Say comes down. This is, a per- this is a present tense verb. It comes and comes and comes and comes and comes and comes and comes. It's a stream constantly flowing. Good gifts, perfect gifts are flowing from above to you. And so you have grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Aren't you glad that God has so many good things, not just spiritual things, but natural things? Aren't you glad that you, don't have, you didn't have to come here riding on a horse? You would have a one horsepower. One horsepower. My car only has 120 horsepower. Was well, better than one horsepower. Aren't you glad you get to drive? There was millions and millions of people that never got to drive in a car and get where you are as fast as you get, especially when you speed. How about having a dishwasher? Oh, washer and dryer. See, I get to run things at my house. <laughs> Vacuum. We have all these wonderful things, and you, and you think your life's so tough. Now, God's blessed you greatly. Amen. And it's flowing down from the Father of lights. God is the creator of lights. This speaks of the natural lights and spiritual lights. So God created the sun for the day, the moon for night, the stars. Don't you love the, looking up at night? when you're outside the city and see all the constellations. And when I was in high school, I had an astronomy course and I had learned the different, uh, you know, constellations. And one night I was going to impress my mom. I was in high school and I said, Mom, it was just, the sun was going down. It was kind of dusk and there was a bright star in the, on the horizon. I said, Mom, guess what? That's not a star. That's Venus. She said, Son, Venus is moving. It was a plane. So astronomy was not my future. But God creates the spiritual lights. Do you know that the Bible says in Ephesians that you're children of light? That your spirit is light in the Lord. Well, pastor, what color will I be in heaven? (gasps) Light. You'll have a glow. Tell someone you're going to have a glow. 
and your spirit is lit up and he's your father, God gives birth to light with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. See, when the earth rotates, the sun is moving across the sky and as the sun moves, the shadow, the shadows shift and at night they get longer as you're going down. And so it says God's not like that. He's, there's no variation, no shadow of turning with God. He's not going to be uh, sunny one day and shady the next. One day you're going to get good things and the next you're going to get a bad thing to teach you something. Tell someone God's never shady. He's always sunny. Do you know light does not cast a shadow? I have a picture of a match. Do you see something missing on the shadow? Light doesn't cast a shadow. God is light. And you are light in Him. So look at John 10.10. 10. I'm going to give you perfect theology. Raise your hand if you want some perfect theology. You learned at church today. Well, this verse. Always go to this verse if you want perfect theology. John 10.10 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. Say that's bad. Bad, bad, bad. I have come, Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Say that's good. That's good. Good, 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 good. So here's your perfect theology. The devil's a bad devil and God's a good God. So let's go take this further. The devil's always a bad devil and God is always a good God. And they never change places. And the devil's not on his payroll. And he's not, on, he's not hiring him out to do dirty work. He's called the adversary to God. Look at verse 18. Of his own will, this is God the Father, he brought us forth, gave birth to us by the word of the truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. His own will. Say his own will. Amen. Salvation was his plan, not your plan. He made the plan for you over around before you even got in the situation. For Adam and Eve sinned, he had a plan. The lamb, the lamb slain from the foundation, before the foundation of the world. And God's desire has always been you, and he's never changed his mind about you. He's loved you from eternity, and he's never changed his mind about you. Well, I've let him down. He's never changed his mind about you. Salvation is not a result of our determination or our plan. It was God's plan from start to finish. And it was his own will he brought forth the new creation. Our new birth is from him. See, sin and man brings forth and gives birth to, to death, but God gives birth to life. It's by reliance upon the divine life in our spirit that we truly are saved from sin. You need to understand that as a Christian. It's not your willpower. It's not by soul power. It's by spirit power, life on the inside, resting in it, the vine, receiving the life. It conquers sin. Jesus' life was a sin-conquering life. And that life's on the inside. And if you'll just trust it to do its work, it will, con it will conquer its light. And li life is the light of men. Life is light. And that light will overcome darkness whenever it finds it. But you must yield to the life on the inside, not trying to do something God's already did by your willpower. 2 Peter 1.4. We're, we're almost done. I have a few more verses, and there's, and there's a caboose coming. 2 Peter 1.4. By which you have been given exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Say, I'm a partaker... Of the, divine of the divine nature. Now don't get crazy with this. You're not God. Tell someone you're not God. Now tell someone else you're really not God. If you're born again in your spirit, you're a partaker of the divine nature that cannot sin, that cannot be tempted. And so if you draw and let the life of God just rest knowing that that life's flowing on the inside of you, and it, don't use your willpower to try to overcome sin. Just rest in Jesus living on the inside of you. You'll find yourself, you focus on Jesus in the Spirit, 
you'll find yourself lifted up above sin. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 5.10 says, For if we've been enemies, by when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son on the cross. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Shall be. That's talking about our daily life being delivered from sin by His life on the inside. The nature through your new birth. Romans 6.14 For sin shall have no dominion over you since you're not under law where God demands from you to do it. But under grace where He does it. By His life. And so He brought you forth by the word of the truth. Jesus is the Logos, the word of God and He gave birth through Jesus to you. And so you have the nature of Jesus on the inside of you and you have the truth on the inside of you that you would be a kind of first fruits of all his creatures. That, the, what's the first fruit? It's the firstlings. Tell someone you're a firstling of the new creation. You know, you're the first, the first of the new creation that throughout eternity God's going to continue to create. He's a creator. It's who he is. And it says, of, his, of the increase of his government, there'll be no end. He's going to continue to create. Why did he create a universe with 100 trillion galaxies? I can get my own galaxy. Have your own. You have two or three. But you're the first of what God's doing. You're members of the firstborn, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bow your heads. Father, I thank you so much. That there's temptations in this earth, but Lord, you've given us your life, your nature on the inside, the love of God. You've given us Jesus to live from. And where we put our mind or our focus determines whether we'll be in the flesh or draw and live in the spirit. Say, Pastor, I'll be honest with the Lord today that I've been entertaining some of the temptations to satisfy a need out of the will of God or out of the timing of God, not waiting on Him to take a shortcut, do it my way. And I've entertained that in my heart and my mind. I haven't done it yet. Or maybe I'm in the midst of it and, Pastor, I'm I'm in that sin that's growing in my life, but I I want it to, to stop. I want it to die. Well, it can by the power of God, by the life of Christ, by the love of God. It can be reversed. You say, Pastor, that's where I'm at today. And I'm acknowledging to God, I have my eyes on the wrong direction, but I'm going to put my eyes on you, Jesus. And I realize you live in me. That's where I'm going to put my focus when temptation comes. I'm going to know that you're living in me and let your life do it for me. Deliver me from sin. Deliver me from addiction. Deliver me from habits by the power of God on the inside of me, by the grace of God. You say, that's where I'm at, Pastor. Every eye closed is between you and the Lord. I want you to lift your hand high and say, Lord, this is me. For some people that need to have their hands raised or not raised. It's called humility. I have my eyes on you. I'm getting them off of the temptation, that natural thing. And Lord, I say, you're my need. You I am complete in you. You're all I need. You're enough for me, Jesus. I'm complete in you. And I look to you when I'm tempted. And I thank you that you overcome for me. And you get the glory. Thank you for your love and your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship God together.